I'm Luby Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we are talking to R.P. Wolvau, the prolific author of the Bears and Eagles saga, amazing works of historical fiction centered on World War II. In fact, he's also written some science fiction. He's got quite an anthology. We're going to get to it all. Our thanks to the marketing team at Sweet Spire Literature Management for helping us put R.P. Wallbaum into the spotlight today. R.P., thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's awesome. You have a lot of books out there. Many of them are centered on historical fiction, World War II, the Eagles and Bears saga. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, it basically started off as uh, just family history tracing. I mean, uh, uh, my people came from what's now called the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, they immigrated there in the eight, 1810s from uh, what's now called Germany. Um, <laughs> and we came here in 1891. Um, yeah, I mean, they thought they had a cold in Ukraine. Wait till they get to Winnipeg in 1891 <laughs> in December. So, um, yeah, and I, just as I was doing research for that, I was also um, doing a bunch of work for the federal government in Canada. And one of the buildings I went to was the local armories in Calgary, Alberta. And on one of my trips there, uh, the boys were getting ready to, to to deploy to Afghanistan, and they were all pumped. They were all young guys, you know, 18 to 25. And I went, wow, you know, I didn't even know we were sending guys there. From They were just local reserve guys, part-time soldiers. Um, and like three weeks later, one of them was dead. Mm. And I went, wow, you know, that's... You know, that was amazing to me. And then, then I started doing research, and... Um, Canada is, has been participants for since the Boer War mm -hmm. in, in it, overseas conflicts. And it, we're always lumped in either with the British or the Americans. So I said, well, you know, hey, let's, let's bring that to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, they did a lot of those young fellas. And they were mostly uh, just young fellas that just joined for the sake of. Um, a lot of them died. A lot of them had uh, you know, massive injuries, and I worked with a lot of them, uh, World War II vets and Korea vets. Uh, my uncle was in World War II, my mom's older brother, and Korea, and his peace, peace, he, was, he was a lifer. He was in peacekeepers, keep, peacekeeping missions in Cyprus. And then I started, my father-in-law was, was a Cossack. He was a carded Cossack, and he... he yeah, they had it pretty rough, and then uh, they went. They, they ran uh, when Stalin uh, did what he did in Ukraine back in the twenties. And uh, his father disappeared. Um, his mother brought he and his three brothers up in Poland on her own. And then when the Nazis came in, they grabbed him and shipped him off to Germany. So he, after the war, he couldn't go home because the Russians would have done what Russians do. So he came here. Um, and he, he married my mother-in-law, who was actually German, who came here after the war as well. So um, I started putting all these things together, and I started researching and, and remembering stories that I heard as a young gaffer, like my great-grandfather was still alive. But we used to visit, and all my grandfather's uncles and they would talk about the old country and what it was like and what the stories they had heard from their grandparents on how rough it was and how hard it was for them. And I just started doing research. And they always said if it wasn't for the Cossacks, they'd have died. Right. You know, and Cossacks get such a bad rep. And yet here they are helping these immigrant Germans out who they didn't know. They were actually, they were, they had been robbed. And everything stolen from them. One of the families that they were traveling with had been killed. Um, they didn't have any water. They didn't have any food. And I guess it was, you know, they were on their last legs when the Cossacks found them. And they took them into their settlement and they helped them out, got them back up to health, um, showed them some good land, helped them build the land, how to farm. Because coming from Germany, going to the steppes of Ukraine, I mean, it's a big difference, right? Right. Germany's got lush everything. And, and then they came here and they, they brought that 
that with them. You know, that knowledge they, from the steps works perfect for out here because it's basically where they, where they ended up settling just east of Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, we have a saying, you can see your dog run away for three days <laughs> because there, there's hardly any trees and it's pretty flat. Um, so yeah, I just started doing all that research and coming up with more and more things. And I said, you know what, wouldn't it be interesting to, to, cause there's so, because of after the second world war and first world war, there's so little historic knowledge about Germany as a whole. And it's an, it's a fascinating country. Um, and they had a massive revolution. We hear about the Irish famine and then all that kind of stuff and how all the Irish immigrants got here. Well, that famine was also pretty widespread in Europe. And in Germany, they actually had a big revolution. And the Prussians came in and stopped it. So I said, well, why don't we take some guys from Wittenberg, where it's, which is where my family's from, and they were soldiers, and let's have them, you know, the Prussians say, okay, you go over to this town over here, and you get rid of all those people, because they're, we don't want them around anymore. And this whole regiment, en masse, deserting, and running to what is now called Ukraine. And that, a lot of that did happen. And the Cossacks would take them in, and blah, blah, blah. Just, just made a big story about all this. And then, of course, you had to join the army as part of the Russian you know, citizenship. So these guys got grabbed and they got sent off to go fight the Turks or whoever the bad guys were at the time. And then I said, okay, so here's, a, there, here's the premise. So I start off with a bang on the first book and it's five guys young fellas, 18, 19 years, maybe 20 years old. And I went, what would I, what would, what would I feel like? Having never seen this before. And I got a whole bunch of these, I call them turks because there was a lot of raiding and stuff going on at that time. And you got these guys with lances and swords attacking you, you and your five buddies. And you're just standing there. How would I feel? So that's why I've got them, you know, they're, they're scared. They're dropping bullets after their first shots. They don't know what's going to happen. So that, that's kind of how I, I, I put myself in those situations. And then just because this guy could speak Russian, he could speak German, he could speak French and English because he had a pretty good education. He happened to be in the wrong place at the right time. And they needed somebody who could translate all those languages. And he had to be an officer, but this fellow wasn't. Right. So they made him an officer and they gave him some, they made him a, a minor baron and, you know, with, out in the middle of the stick someplace, just so he could fit in. And that's how we progressed to the story. And then after that, oh, by the way, sir, you have to give us a whole battalion of people to go to Afghanistan to help our English buddies. So, right. and that's how I started. They ended up going to Afghanistan. They come back home. They meet up with some British liaison guys, one of whom is a, a Canadian. And they start talking to some American guys and some Canadian guys. And they said, hmm, we're leaving. And they came to Canada. And right. that's, I just progressed from there. And it ends up back in Afghanistan at the end. Which was your first book? I know there's lots of Bears and Eagles books. Which was your first? Uh, Bears and Eagles was the first. Just Bears and Eagles. Now, for the folks at home, explain what Bears and Eagles are. Okay. The Bears would be the Russian part. And like they, they've integrated with the Cossacks, so the Russian and the Cossacks. So that's the Bears. And the Eagles are the Germans. Gotcha. gotcha. All together. And then when they, they make their battalion up, they've got a service battalion. And they've got combat troops, right? So the combat troops are eagles and the support troops are bears. And gotcha. they have they have a little they have a little badge they put on their, their collars to designate. But I mean it's just like the Canadian Army and the US Marines. Everybody fights because right. they get set off in the middle of nowhere by themselves a lot. <clears throat> so even you know, cooks, cooks and and Dishwashers have to fight sometimes, so that that's how that went. Um, they turn out to be elite troopers because the, the deal that they made with the Canadian government 
and I took that deal. I, I stole that right from the, the First Nations treaties that were signed, except I added, <clears throat> so they are a nation within a nation, but they have to supply troops when required. Gotcha. So they, they, in order to be a citizen of their colony, you have to serve a minimum of five years full time, and then you get all the benefits. You're a citizen of Canada automatically, but not, you know, if you don't serve, you don't get. So that's, you know, kind of how that went. And mm -hmm. I just kind of progressed from that. And then I went, okay, well, and it's tough. I mean, you get really involved with these characters and they're going to die because, I mean, nobody lives forever, right? I started right. off in Canada in 1870 and it ends in like 19, 2005 or 2008. So you get all tied up with these characters and then they, you know, they got to die. But it's allowed you to go from era to era to era. Um, yeah. And experience through the eyes of these soldiers, the soldiering experience, which is yeah, quite Yeah, and the whole family. And, you know, because I grew up with soldiers and stuff, and yeah, they're tough guys. But they also aren't. I mean, they, they feel it. They right. just don't let anybody know. Um, one of the things that uh, that I noticed, um, because I had, you know, all the, the Second World War and First World War relatives and stuff like that, hearing their stories and then meeting fellas from Vietnam and the differences. So the differences are the boys in the First World War and Second World War in Korea went by boat and train. So they had a lot of time to download with their buddies and, and get unlo unload all that stuff, right? Whereas the one fella that I spoke to from Vietnam said he was in a firefight in the morning and he was at home having a shower that evening. Amazing. Washing all the dirt off. So there was no, no way for them, you know, just instant, bang. You got yeah. to reintegrate into civilian society that fast. So that's the big, you know, between now and then. Um, and I also the way that. soldiers were viewed. I mean, the soldiers, yeah. unfortunately, in the Vietnam era were viewed as villains by some. It was an unpopular war yeah, and people horrible. took it out on the soldiers, which was completely ridiculous and unfair, but completely ridiculous and unfair things happen in this world. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of, I've got, pros and cons comments on how I portray stuff. But, you know, that's the way things were in the 1870s. Right. It, you know, it's just the way they were. Mm -hmm. And why, why gloss over it? I mean, there's so much glossing over of the, of the West and how things were happening there. Um, it wasn't nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're in war, it's not nice. I, I, I spoke to one fella and, he, and I said, you know, what would happen with a German soldier if you just shot your buddy and he threw his rifle down and surrendered? And he said, what do you think would happen? Right. You know? yeah. And one of the stories my uncle told me was, he said, he, they were fighting the Hitler Youth a lot, the Canadian Army. And, mm -hmm. and he said it, he had a 13-year-old kid buried up to his neck in rubble. And the kid spat at him. And they tried to dig him up. He says, what do you do? I got brothers at it. You know? Yeah, it's incredible stuff. Very, very powerful imagery. Tell me a little bit about your writing process. A lot of it's based on research, it yeah. seems. Tell me about that, yeah. how you go about finding the people who will give you the insights and the information that you need to tell these stories effectively. Uh, the wonderful thing about the internet is you can find what you're looking for. Right. You know. Um, I was an active hunter and outdoorsman, so I know about firearms. Um, a lot of it is you write what you know. Um, I spent a lot of time out in the woods, uh, you know, weeks at a time with horseback, um, living out of tents, the, the old uh, miners' tents, the big white wall tents with the uh, stoves and you know, 30 below. And that was fun. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of experience and you'll see that come out. Um, I just start, okay, where do I want my guys? They're going to relax. Where are we going to go? Well, I go to relax out in the bush. So right. I have my guys going out in the bush, just sitting by a beaver pond, you know, relaxing. 
um, reminiscing. Um, you'll see a lot of times they'll just stop talking and start looking off into the distance. Yeah. So that happens a lot when you, when you hang around with soldiers. So yeah, I write what I know. Um, I've done a lot in my life. I've flown airplanes. Um, my car raced for a while. I did a lot of hunting and fishing, you know, and I, I'm like, I was a dad. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, a lot of the love scenes in that are based on, on my life and my wife's and how I felt. I mean, I feel, I have to feel it. And then I try to put it, paint a picture. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to live a life if you're going to be a strong writer, I feel, that you have to have a lot of experiences. I'm a journalist. I like to think that I'm a good writer because I've seen so much of life. I've been there in 9-11. I've been there for the downing of JFK Jr.'s plane. I've been there for multiple presidential elections. And like you said, it, it all becomes part of you. It all becomes part of your story and it all becomes something you can tap. Yeah. I mean, that's what I try to do. Um, yeah. I know but my first book, um, you know, you're all in a big rush and you're like, oh yeah, this is going to be great and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to rewrite it because I, I think it's, it's almost 200 pages and I think I only had like 10 chapters. So <laughs> I, mean, I gotta, I gotta split it up a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, it's a learning process, right? I mean, right. when I start writing, I just write. Um, some of my sentences are like 12 pages long. Right. I just, I just write, I get it out of my head. Yeah. yeah. I lose it. Um, I did start trying to carry a notepad with me and write things down, but you know what? I can't read my own writing. So why bother? I just keep it kind of all up in here and, and then, and I start and they just go yeah. and then I'll read it over and I'll edit it myself, self edit it five or six or 10 or 12 times. Mm -hmm. And then I'll send it off to an editor a professional and then i'll do the rewrites and start all over again it's a right. long process it is you have to be patient and you have to throw your eagle out the window because the editor is actually looking after your best interests so what i i like to say yeah i read your comments i go outside and kick the side of the house two or three times <laughs> and then come back in and agree with what you're saying exactly so most, I mean, most yeah. writers will tell you that the art of writing is the art of the rewrite where you have a yeah. good idea it's how you tell it, whether you begin at the end, whether you begin at the middle. I mean, because it's not always beginning at the beginning, you know. No, yeah. no. And, and, that, and that's with Windriders. And I went, so I, I came to the end of Bears and Eagles and I went, okay, where do I go from here? I mean, this is getting old. little seven books. And Windriders is science fiction now. It didn't start off that way. Yeah, It didn't start off that way. The first book is actually... Um, a young fella that grew up with all these guys and he is an, he's a total different ball game he's like the special forces guy and things that happened to him and then I went okay well that's just kind of more of the same and I kind of like science fiction so let's let's have these guys shanghai to some other planet and they gotta <laughs> they gotta operate as mercenaries and take it from there and that that's that's where that went that's how I started that so I've got uh, him, I've got his, his, his wife, who turned, a lady who turns out to be his wife later uh, in the next book. She's this kind of the center, uh, kind of based on my story relationship with my wife. Um, <laughs> and then the next one is, is something that happens with their daughter later on. And then, then I'm, I'm going to release the first book as a prequel. Mm. Uh, Cal's Quest is kind of, I went, hmm, this is an interesting concept. And I just said, you know what? I don't like zombies, <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's do a post -ap -po -pop, I, I can't pronounce it. Apocalyptic. That yeah. It's a tough one. Um, let's do that. But I don't want to have zombies involved, right? So um, he's a young fella in, in his senior year at high school. He doesn't really know what he wants to do for himself afterwards. Everybody's kind of pushing him to go to university, but he doesn't know if he wants to go or not. So he takes a spring break and he goes out in the mountains mm -hmm. for a week. And he sees some weird things happening in the sky. And he comes home and there's nobody. There's nobody. Wow. He's, he's by himself. There's no human beings anywhere. There's no power. There's no natural gas. 
there's nothing. So he's a farm kid, so he knows how to survive. I mean, they've got solar panels, you know, I have too. And they've got solar panels and all that kind of thing, so he can survive. But he knows, okay, summer's coming, but so's winter. So I got to get ready for that. And that's how I start. One of the, one of the, my editor and a couple of comments I got from readers said, wow, that's the first book where you go through the first 30 or 40 pages and nobody says a word. That's quite a compliment. It's all, do it's all dialogue and it's okay. How would I feel? What would, cause I grew up, I, when I was young, my, my mom's folks didn't have power. Right. Um, they, they cooked off of coal and wood stoves, um, in the middle of the prairie in Saskatchewan. So, so I, okay, this is how we got to do it. My grandfather used to take me out to milk cows and, you know, do all the other chase chickens that don't have heads on and things like that. Um, right. so yeah. And I helped my mom and grandparents can. So I know how to, you know, it would take me a while, but I do know how to do that. And I just, I asked my kids, what would you guys do if the power went off tomorrow right. and stayed off? And the, the kids today have no idea because if it's not on their phone, if it's not on their computer, it's, uh, you know, it's tough. Well, I mean, we try to instill, you know, different skills in them, but, you know, in this digital age, they're not out like, splitting wood too much, I guess. You know, and because I raced cars, I know that gasoline does go bad. Right. So what are you going to do that? Yeah, there might be a lot of gas laying around, you know, underground and things like that. But what are you going to do when it doesn't work anymore? Right. So, yeah, it's just kind of putting all in it. Like I say at the end, you know, in, in my blurb, you know, he's all alone. Where is he? Yeah, I love it. I, I feel like we should resurrect Charlton Heston to play the part. <laughs> yes, it's... <laughs> Not really that way, but it is. In a, way. in a way, I mean, Charlton Heston is the, in my opinion, the ultimate sci-fi solo soul survivor yeah. of the of the post-apocalyptic world, right? Yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but he ends yeah. up meeting, you know, one by one people kind of show up, so. right? Right, and it's just you know, hey, they all got to get together, and, and especially out here, I mean, you're gonna die, right? Mother Nature don't don't doesn't have horse around up here. So if you're not set up, you're going to die. And they, it seems they like the to... lessons that nature has taught you living there in Western Canada have been very influential in your work. Where people yeah. literally die if they miss the bus, right? Um, when I, I uh, three or four years of my early working career, I worked on the Canadian Pacific Railroad uh, as a lineman. And there were grades along the side of the, of the line hmm. and you, you do some research and yeah, the, there would be a big snowstorm or something. And then they would find these people dead in their homes, either frozen to death or yeah. a lot of people went crazy. You know? Yeah. It, cabin fever, right? Yeah. It wasn't pleasant out here. Yeah. Where exactly are you in? Not exactly, exactly, but whereabouts are you? Are you in Calgary? Um, Where are you? I'm I'm about an hour north of Calgary. Okay. So I'm not really in the desert, but I'm close. Close, hey, yeah. Um, I've been to Calgary, and uh, it's not New York City. It's a nice little city. Yeah. But uh, getting an hour outside of Calgary, you've got a lot of open land around you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, it's, I'm, I'm spoiled. Okay, let's, let's just face it. Pretty much everybody in Alberta is spoiled. Um, I can go an hour east and I'm in the depth. There is actually sand dunes mm. and badlands. Like Drumheller's an hour. That's where the Royal Tyrrell Museum is. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not as deep or as wide as the Grand Canyon, but that area is, has a lot of badlands and big canyons. I go an hour to the west and I'm right in the mountains. Mm. Yeah. Like right in them. Go an hour south, back in the in the well. It's not really desert, but it's it's rolling hills desert. Um, three hours north of the U.S. border. So yes. you're almost down in uh, Glacier National Park, three hours south here, I presume, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah beautiful yeah. area, absolutely. Yes, beautiful I mean, area. and that you know the mountains. I can, I wake up every morning and I see them. And some mornings it looks like you can just walk down the street, 
you know, they're, they're two hours away. You know? yep. Like um, you said, you can watch your dog run away for three days, right? Well, not where I live. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm kind of right on the edge of the Palliser Triangle. Okay. It's the big, that's, it's the start of the Great Plains. Sounds Just great. Big, Wanted to ask you about movie making. Your books are very, very visual. If you had a magic wand or a producer came to you and you had a pitch, which of your books would you want to see made into a movie first and why and who would you cast, that kind of stuff? I'd like the Bears and Eagles. Mm. You know, take them all, lump them together or pick one. I mean, they're all very poignant. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a bunch of young people, you know. Yeah, yeah, they're told the best of it into uh, it's they're terrific reading, so they're great books as standalones. But if in a media that is much more condensed, you could cull the best of each and uh, really yeah. make for the film. I mean, um, I'm gonna think Bears Mall because that that covers uh, the Second World War and Korea, the special forces. Um, that that was just south of Calgary. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, just outside of Helena, Montana, where they where they did the the, the Devil's Brigade is what yeah. they were called. And a third of those guys were Canadian, and about half of those guys were these young reservists out of Calgary. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, they see the movie, and they go, "Oh yeah," blah blah blah. But no, the it wasn't that way. The 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 American soldiers were top notch soldiers. They did they didn't just grab whoever. And the same with the Canadians. So, it's, Absolutely. Well, it was, RP, it's been amazing talking with you. You yep. have quite a volume of work. I would encourage our viewers to get on to Amazon and look at the many books. Book one of Bears and Eagles is simply called Bears and Eagles, correct? Yeah. And that's a great starting point. And then you can follow the journey all the way into the future. R.P. Walbaum, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was awesome. It's a pleasure. Great speaking with you. Truly enjoyed it. And to our folks at home, thank you for watching. Until next time on Spotlight.